Hello and welcome to Christ Community Church Online. My name is Elijah Ball and I'm the Student Ministries Director here at the church and I'm so excited that you are joining us for this week's message online. If you are new to our church and you want to get more connected, one way you can do that is by texting CCC New to 55498 and it helps us get more connected with you as well. Also, if you want to partner with what God is doing here, one small way you can do that is by giving online. And there's two ways to do that. You can go to our website, cccbrockport.org, or you can download the app, uh, the Church Center app, right to your phone. And lastly, our vision here is to encounter, pursue, and live like Jesus. And our hope and prayer for you today is to encounter Jesus through this message, no matter what day of the week it is. And so without further ado, let's get started. Wow, Adam, you look great today. <laughs> something something about your outfit just really speaks to me. <laughs> it's like looking in the mirror. Good morning, church family. So glad that we can be together. Lots have been covered already. I just want to jump right into it if I can. And as Jenna said, we've been in this series all summer, just asking the Lord, teach us once again to pray. In fact, maybe reteach us, maybe unlearn us <laughs> the bad things we've learned already so that we can learn what you really want us to carry in this season. We've been um, redefining prayer as just what Jesus taught and just what Jesus modeled in the scriptures, which is a life with the Father. That might sound way too obscure or just like ethereal or just out there of like, what does that even mean, right? Uh, What we mean is Jesus made a point to say, I can do nothing apart from my Father. I'm walking in connection with my Father. I only do what I see and hear my Father do. And that involved living a lifestyle, a commitment, a devotion to private time one-on-one with just Him and God. And he invites us into that kind of lifestyle as well that we're going to talk about today uh, a little bit more practically maybe. But I want to I sort of shift gears today. Uh, as Jenna said, there's been a little bit of conviction. There's been, there's been maybe like a case made for prayer. You know, maybe most of our Sundays without even knowing it, uh, we've kind of slipped into this pattern of like, let me try to, to convince you why prayer is important, why if you haven't been praying, you know, you should just like, come up here on your knees weeping and just, God, you know, help me, help me figure this out. Help me to move past the place of, of like, I just don't want to, to see what the mystery is here. What am I not seeing? What am I not connecting to? Um, Today, I want to maybe shift things a little bit. Let me read you a quote real quick from Wayne Grudem. He's, you know, a big brain in in Christianity. He wrote uh, several uh, really, really beautiful books, one called Bible Doctrine, and this is what he said in there about prayer. When we truly pray, we as persons in the wholeness of our character are relating to God as a person in the wholeness of his character. Thus, all that we think or feel about God comes to expression in our prayer. It is only natural that God would delight in such activity and place emphasis on it in his relationship. And so, so we've been talking all about why it's important for us, and, and let's just be honest for a second. We do come into church mostly with that kind of mindset of what's in it for me, right? I mean, we kind of live all of life that way, of like, you know, the commercial, the, the sales pitch, the guy at the mall that wants to, like, polish your wife's nails or your nails. I don't know. Um, but it's like, what's in it for me that that question is kind of constantly, we're kind of constantly filtering the decisions of, well, I only have so much time, so I'm going to pick the thing that's got the most in it for me, or I only have so much money, so I'm going to buy the thing that's, that's, you know, most in it for me. I want to really shift today. I, I want to just do a complete 180 and just ask a different question today in our Teach Us to Pray series. What's in it for God? What's in it for Him? (laughs) Not what do I feel or enjoy or get out of it. God, what do you want to get out of this? What emotions come to God's heart when we pray? What does God feel when you and I pray? Because honestly, if we're going to keep saying that we love God, the best way, uh, okay, let me uh, break it down for a second. I'm no relationship expert. Hi, honey. Hi, honey. Okay. 
I'm no relationship expert, but here's one thing I do know, and I think all of us who, who, I mean, we all have relationships of some sort. You don't have to be married to know a lot about relationships, Um, but a close relationship or an intimate relationship, there's our uncomfortable word, I said it, okay, Um, our intimate relationships, you can only go so far or so deep with someone if you're only thinking about yourself, right? Right? So if we're going to keep showing up on Sunday and saying, we love you, God, we love you, God, we love you, God, we want to grow in our love for you, eventually we've got to kind of turn around and go, okay, let's stop thinking about just me for a second. What's on his heart? What does he like? (laughs) We don't ask this nearly enough, do we? God, what do you like? What are you into? (laughs) What's your thing? What are, what are the emotions that God feels when we pray? Um, I want to call my message treasured, precious, and dearly loved. Um, and I'll, I'll get to why that's the title in, in just a second. But I want to look at the book of Daniel together. And you might be thinking, what an odd book. And I, honestly, I haven't preached very much out of Daniel. Um, but I read it for my own just personal study a, a few months back. It was really captivated by a few things that I had never noticed before. And if that's not a plug to just keep reading your Bible, it doesn't matter how many times you read it, you always see something fresh and something new, and the Holy Spirit's always helping uh, to uncover some things. But let me give you just a little bit of backdrop about this little, you know, tiny, kind of in the middle of a lot of crazy things going on, this little book in the history of Israel. Uh, This guy named Daniel, he was a captive servant taken from his homeland in Judah, into captivity in Babylon, by, <coughs> excuse me, by King Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadnezzar for all of you VeggieTale fans. Um, Daniel was of royal lineage. In fact, it's likely he could have even been of the king's family um, because in Daniel 1, we see that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, said to his chief of staff, bring to the palace, to his palace in Babylon, some of the young men we've just captured from Judah's royal family, other noble families who had been brought to Babylon. And this is what he said, select only the strong, healthy, good-looking young men. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, gifted with knowledge, good judgment, suited to serve in the royal palace. I'm looking for the best of the best. And Daniel and some of his friends are brought to serve in this pagan nation, to serve this pagan king against his will. Captain, you know, Judah, the, the king of Judah had kind of rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, that's it. So he sent his army, they besieged Judah, they tore the whole place down, and they brought back captives with them. Daniel, although of noble birth, although smart and wise and strong and handsome and had just all, you know, when you see somebody like that, you're just like, they just have the whole world in front of them and then interrupted by this very kind of traumatic event in his life. As we continue through Daniel's story, just for context, in Daniel 6, it tells us that Daniel lived a lifestyle of prayer, a life of devotion to God through prayer. He devoted himself to prayer morning, noon, and night, three times a day, likely modeling his life after his royal forefather, David, who wrote in Psalm 55, morning, noon, and night, I cry out to you in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. And Daniel lived this kind of life of devotion. Corey Russell in his book, Teach Us to Pray, he said, the life of prayer is the practical, mundane choices that we make every day to prioritize a time and a place and never let anything or anyone get in the way of the holy place between you and God. Daniel lived this kind of devoted lifestyle. And in chapter 10, where I want to read a few verses in just a second, what, what happens in Daniel is every chapter kind of skips a chunk of time. If you think of Daniel's life as being lived in one rapid story, what actually happens is uh, some chapters skip decades even. Daniel ends up serving for roughly 70 years under four different kings in Babylon. And in chapter 10, it's the beginning of the fourth king's reign, and Daniel has been there for 70 years, serving in the palace, serving faithfully before the Lord, Daniel's been there praying every day for 70 years, morning, noon, and night. I don't know what the math is. I could have done it ahead of time. I didn't, but, you know, know, seven days a week, 
365, three times a day for 70 years. Daniel's been praying. He's been serving in a culture and in a society that is mostly hostile, sometimes even violent towards his faith. But he stays devoted to the Lord. 70 years of praying, morning, noon, and night, and yet he's still a captive in this foreign country. And in chapter 10, where we jump into Daniel's story is he's been praying and fasting and mourning for three weeks. Because Jeremiah, the prophet, he had prophesied that um, the, the remnant of Israel would be released after 70 years of captivity. And so this is about that marker where the first remnant of Israelites have traveled back to the promised land. And they started trying to rebuild their homes and rebuild their cities. And that was like two years ago. And Daniel has just received a bad report that their attempt to rebuild has met severe opposition and it's come to a screeching halt. And Daniel is brokenhearted. He's, his people, his family, the, the promised land, like the, the, the Mecca of his whole like basis religion and, and, and relationship with God, like finally some good news. We're, we're starting to rebuild. We're starting to rebuild homes and rebuild the city. And then he gets this report that it's all come to a halt because of opposition. And he's brokenhearted and he's been fasting and mourning. And he's standing on the edge of the Tigris River. Daniel sees a vision of a heavenly being, an angel, speaking to him. And this is what the angel says. Daniel 10, starting in verse 11. Daniel, you are very precious to God. The language there, precious, the original word means precious or treasured or dearly loved. There's the title of my message today. Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up for I've been sent to you. And then in verse 12, he says, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I've come to answer your prayer. We're going to skip over verse 13 because there's a little bit of the angel being like, I would have been here sooner, but I took a left instead of a right. Map quest got me off. And then there was this Prince of Persia guy who was trying to fight with me. And that's, you know, a story for another day. But in verse 14, he says, now I'm here to explain what will happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. So let me break this down for just a second and kind of maybe paraphrase what's happening here. The angel is, in essence, saying, Daniel, your love for God and your love for your people has moved God's heart so much he can't resist anymore. God was just like bursting with delight in you going, I've got to send a message to Daniel. He's so precious to me. I want to communicate some things that he might see in the future, maybe some things even after his life that he'll never see because I just care about him so much he's so precious to me. It's beautiful, right? Daniel, heartbroken, but still hungry and humble in his pursuit of God. He's committed himself to a life of prayer. His devotion catches the attention of heaven to the point that God just can't help any longer but send a message. (laughs) He says, you're precious. You're dearly loved. You're treasured. I've heard all of your prayers, Daniel. And I've come to, to give you a message. I want to fill in some of the blanks. Now, This might sound really just outlandish to you this morning. In fact, I'm really concerned that a story like this might feel so out of reach today that that you're like, could I even hope for something like that? Like this is one guy in like thousands of years of history in the Old Testament that got a message like this, that you're precious. What, What an interesting word for God to use, right? Daniel, you're precious to me. But, you know, Daniel has lived a dramatic life. He's had a lot of crazy things happen. And it might just, too many of us today, feel like that's just a little, that's a little too big. It's a little too far out. It's a little too out of my reach. Maybe even just completely unmotivated. It's kind of like if you watch a documentary, right? Uh, And you're watching, like, somebody do something extreme or crazy. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen this documentary, 14 Peaks. I know Mark has. um, Of this guy, this crazy Nepali mountaineer who took on this quest to climb 14, all of the, the, the world's highest peaks above 8,000 meters, so Mount Everest and a bunch of other ones you've never heard of. And what he's trying to do is the, the former world record is the guy that climbed them all the fastest. First off, it's just a big deal to do them all. 
Then to do them in the shortest amount of time, the guy who held the record was, he had done them in seven years. This guy is trying to do them in seven months. Back to back to back to back to back. And I won't ruin the end of it. You can watch it on on Netflix if you want to. Um, But here's the thing. You might watch something like that like I do and go, wow, that's so cool. But I'm not out here with my backpack on trying to like hike any peaks. It's too far out of reach financially. It's too far out of reach probably physically for me to even think about getting up, you know, where the oxygen is so thin, right? Like it's cool, right? So if if this morning you're like, yeah, cool, Daniel, cool, bro. Cool story, bro. Right. But it never connects to your heart where you're like, I want. You're hoping I'd finish it with that, but I'm just trying to get real childlike today. Me want. (laughs) Me want that. Okay. If it never gets into, here's, if you're thinking like that's not possible, it's really not even what I'm looking for, not interested, how could I help you connect to the story of Daniel this morning, to the idea of being completely confident that you're so precious to God that his heart is moved when you pray? Could I help you at all with that? I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try really hard because all this time so far, we've been talking about what we get out of it. Today, I want to show you what God gets out of it. Instead of thinking about how frustrated you are or, or, you know, am I I good enough? Am I praying enough? Am I reading my Bible enough? You know, anybody ever live through, um, you know, enough Christianity to just kind of, you're just kind of like, am I doing it, God? Like, is this what you want? Is this what you like? Anybody come in on a Sunday and you're like singing and praising? You're like, is this it? I don't know. I see they look like they're really enjoying themselves. I don't know. Um, If you could live, what if you could live with a confidence that God loves the moments that you spend with him? We've talked about what it means for us to spend moments with God and what his presence means to us and our pursuit of him. But what what if God's pursuing you because he loves to spend time with you, and what he gets out of it is so special. I, I, um, I was laughing. This I didn't ask you, Adam, if I could tell this story ahead of time. It's actually not about you, but I was hanging out with Adam and Rich and some other guys, and Adam's brother Mark was there. And if you know Mark Tater, he's really, really funny and really fun to be with. And if you know the Taters, they are crazy passionate about a handful of things. Um, definitely, they all love Jesus, Definitely, they all love their family. They love good food, and they love the Buffalo Bills. Am I right? No, I I didn't get any hoot or holler for the Buffalo Bills this morning. Okay. So Mark's telling the story that um, he was playing golf. Now, Adam, correct me if I get any of this wrong. He was playing golf at a country club, right? And wouldn't you know it, when he turned around to see the Greatest Buffalo Bill on the team right now, Josh Allen, JA-17, QB1, playing in the team right behind him, coming up right behind his group. And uh, he went on to say that he had, they had gotten close enough at one green where Josh Allen's group was waiting for Mark's group to finish up. And Mark said something that made Josh Allen laugh. <laughs> These were Mark's exact words. Correct me if I'm wrong, Adam. I'm on cloud nine right now. I'm putting it on my resume that I made Josh Allen laugh, okay? (laughs) It's the thought that you could make someone really important to you smile or laugh or feel good, right? What if you could know God in such a deep and personal way that you would know if you touched his heart, if you moved him emotionally, if you did things that make him happy, (laughs) Prayer is one of the things that makes God incredibly happy because when you pray, you're showing your love for him and your action, not just your words. When you pray, you're prioritizing time with him. And when you love someone and they prioritize time with you, it's so precious, it's so important, it it makes you just feel like, wow. When you treat someone as a person, specifically God, you treat him as a person, not a presence. This is important for us to to get straight today. Jeremy Riddle in his book, The Reset, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, but these words are just as important to think of God the Father and God the Son this way. He said, he is not a mist. (laughs) He's not a cloud or an atmosphere. He is a person. 
We do very harmful things when we dehumanize people, and we endanger ourselves in the same way when we impersonalize his person. An abstract presence doesn't have a heart or feelings, desires, sensitivity, grief, awareness, nearness, sovereignty, or holiness, but the Holy Spirit most certainly does. I would add to that, we must refuse to think of God in this way, that he's just a vibe or just a feeling. He's a person. We can't treat the Father or Son or Holy Spirit this way. He has a heart. He has feelings. He has desires. He has sensitivity, grief, delight, and joy. And I put it on the screens because I want it to be that important to you this morning. God experiences joy and delight when you and I pray. He was communicating to Daniel, you're so precious to me. It was God's delight that motivated him to send this messenger to Daniel. Tell him how precious and dearly loved he is. Tell him how important his prayers are. Corey Russell, in his book again, he says it like this. There's a life that catches the attention of God. It's a life that is broken, tender, and responsive to his word. God is actually looking for the broken, dependent, interior life in which to make his home, or what scripture refers to as a resting place, where God wants to not just visit, or as we said last week, he's not just looking for a hookup. He wants to take up residence. But he's looking for a place where he's welcome. Daniel was able to live this sort of life, and it caught the attention of God, and he heard heaven. Daniel heard heaven say to him, you're precious, you are dearly loved. And I wonder if anyone else in Scripture comes to mind that heard this kind of message from heaven. Are you thinking of the same person that I'm thinking of this morning? Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One who came to save us, who came as the Lamb of God, slain before the foundations of the world. Jesus also heard this message at both his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration. Let's look at them really quickly. Matthew 3, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him, and a voice from heaven said, what? This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, or my dearly loved Son. Matthew 7, the Mount of Transfiguration, while Jesus was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus came in the flesh with tons of stuff to do and accomplish, but the primary purpose of his life was to be the Father's beloved son. The primary purpose of his life was to be the father's beloved son. And the testimony of Jesus is that there's a heavenly father who loves the son, but not just the son. The father gave the son for the purpose of adopting more children for anyone who would believe in his son, Jesus. Let me throw a couple scriptures at you. John 14, 2, Jesus speaking to the disciples. He said, there is more than enough room in my father's home If this were not so, what I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place. John 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me, Jesus said. We've talked about this a handful of times, but it's worth repeating. It's worth remembering. It's worth saying again that the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Jesus' own words in his prayer to the Father for you. That's why Galatians 4, Paul says, when the right time came, God sent his son so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Think about that for a second. The spirit of Jesus, the spirit of his son, the core of Jesus that said, I can do nothing without the Father, that that prayed and said, God, bring me back into the glory we experienced before the world began, the the 
essence of Jesus, he, he's transferring that to us when we believe in him and believe in the cross and believe in the finished work. And he's giving us the ability to not be slaves in God's house, but to become children, sons and daughters who recognize and understand and live in the reality that we are dearly loved, precious, and treasured. So let me ask you then, <laughs> if Daniel... Let's bring it all together. If Daniel was able to move God's heart so deeply under the old covenant, in the Old Testament, under a covenant based on works and law, under a covenant based on a fading glory, 2 Corinthians says, under a covenant that brought condemnation and just a constant reminder of sin, how much more can you and I touch the heart of God under a new covenant? A new covenant purchased by the blood of Jesus that's based on grace now, not on law. A new covenant of nearness and relationship with God. A covenant that calls every believer a priest that ministers to God's heart. Oh, I'm not done yet. It's a new covenant that shifts from geographical temples to, of worship to where our very own bodies and lives become temples of the Holy Spirit that hold the presence and glory of God. A covenant that makes us more and more like Jesus, the dearly loved son. How much more could we touch the heart of God today when we pray and when we devote ourselves? This is the end game. It has nothing to do with Thanos, okay? The end game is in Revelation 5. We see that we're made for much, much more than just this life. That the more we become like Jesus, the more prepared for eternity we become. And in that eternity, here's a little image in Revelation 5.8 of what's happening right now. When he, the lamb, took the scroll, the four living creatures, these are the same that cry, holy, 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 holy. That's the number one hit song in heaven, and they don't have another one. Holy, 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 right? They keep saying it. And the, the living creatures and the 24 elders, these are the same ones that fall down and cast their crowns. It says they fall down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp representing praise and worship and adoration and golden bowls filled with incense. Check this out. Which are the prayers of the saints. So we're not talking about like grandma's potpourri that's been there since 1988, okay? We're talking about Bowls of incense. In heaven, there's no room before the glory and presence of God for anything that doesn't belong, for anything that doesn't have value, for anything that doesn't have use. There's only room in this place, in this scene of worship in heaven, for things that are eternal and intentional. And God's saying, you know what I like to keep really close to me? Is this, these bowls, these golden bowls of, of incense. It's the precious prayers of the ones that I dearly love. <laughs> in heaven, there's no room for anything except what's eternal and intentional. And in that place, in God's glory, in God's presence, he's holding prayers of people like you and me, and he keeps them in golden bowls. And the heavenly creatures and 24 elders hold and present these prayers before him. What is incense? It's a substance that when combined with fire produces a beautiful, attractive aroma and the aroma is able to elevate or shift the atmosphere of a room. It makes a place of gathering more attractive. Listen to me this morning. Your prayers, God's saying, they're like a, an aroma of incense to me. Your prayers fill heaven with a beautiful aroma. Your prayers are able to elevate and shift atmospheres. Come on, somebody get excited this morning. God experiences joy and delight when you and I pray. It's like incense in front of him, and he's going, oh, I love that. I love that. I love that when they pray. You are precious to God. Lisa, if you want to come up and, and play a little bit. God loves the moments you spend in prayer. He hears and he treasures your words, your time. Daniel's in the middle of obscurity. He's in the, the middle of, honestly, the lowest low point of Israel's history in the Old Testament. And he's saying, I don't care what's going on around me. I don't care how disappointed 
I am in, in the outcome of my life. I'm here 70 years in saying, God, you're still worth it. You're still worth it morning, noon, and night. I don't care if they write laws that say, don't pray to anyone except the king. I'm going to go to my room and meet with the Lord because he's still worth it. I don't care if they throw me in a lion's den. I'm going to devote myself to the Lord because he's so worthy and deserving. Would you stand with me as we get ready to close? If Daniel, in an old covenant, in a dark time for Israel, could devote himself like that and touch the heart of God in a way where God goes, I can't resist sending a message, sending a messenger. I can't resist. I've got to communicate to Daniel what this means to me. How much more the people of God, the redeemed sons and daughters of God who carry the grace and the love and the unmerited favor and the washing of the blood of his son, who've been purchased by the precious blood of his son, how much more could you and I move his heart? How much more precious to the Lord are your prayers? How much more treasured is the time you spend with him? It's time to ask a better question this morning. Not what am I getting out of it? God, I had no idea what you were getting out of this. I wonder this morning if we could maybe together just devote ourselves to a life like this. You might be thinking, well, you don't understand. Daniel didn't have to live what I had to live through. <laughs> Daniel didn't have to have so much opposition to his faith. Whoa, wait a minute. I think, I think if you go back and you read Daniel, you'll see a lot of stuff you can relate to. But this morning, what if we could close our eyes right now and talk directly to the Lord and not treat him like a vibe, not treat him like a feeling, Treat him like a person with a heart, with emotions, with desires, with delight and joy. I say, God, I want to fill your heart with delight. Can we spend a few moments here? We don't, we're, nobody's in a rush, right, this morning? Come on, just close your eyes. Focus your heart on him. Maybe for the first time in a long time, focus your heart away from the things you want and that you're trying to get out of Christianity and that you're trying to get out of church this morning. And shift your heart and go, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm just concerned now what you want, Jesus. What you deserve, Jesus. What you delight in, Jesus. Maybe this morning you're thinking, I had no idea that my prayers, my words, my little bit of time that I set aside to spend with him would end up like a pleasing aroma in heaven. The kind of aroma that gets the attention of heaven and they go, wow. The kind of aroma that God takes a deep breath in and goes, I love, I love this time we're spending. Under a new covenant, under a better covenant, how much more? Do our prayers rise and do our praise and our words and our affection rise to him? Maybe you find it easy to say, God, you're so holy. God, you're way up on a throne. God, you're really far away. Maybe you don't find it as easy this morning to say, God, you're so close. God, you're so near. God, you're paying so, so close attention to me and the, the time that we're spending together. Consider that this morning. Consider that. He's the one who left his throne to come. He's the one who considered his, his glory something to be set aside so that he could humble himself as a servant and live among us so that he could be forever, for all of eternity, known as Emmanuel, God with us. Consider the fact that when Jesus breathed his final breath and surrendered his spirit to the Father once again on the cross, that a veil of thick curtain material that once separated normal human interactions from the Holy of Holies was torn in two, 
and opened and the glory and presence of God broke out of a building and began to dwell in the lives of his people through the Holy Spirit filling. Consider all that happened and transpired and when we read the gospel and when we read the New Testament, couldn't we this morning be that much more convinced that God's leaning in when we speak to him. That we can touch the heart of God this morning when we say we love you, God. That we could respond to what it means to him. That we could maybe put it in these phrases, God, I see some of your love language (laughs) today. You, you're a quality time, words of affirmation kind of God. Yeah. God, we want to touch your heart. We want to live before you as dearly loved children. We don't deserve this kind of nearness, this kind of closeness. We haven't earned it and we never could. But today we're standing on a solid rock, a foundation under our feet that is the finished, complete, perfect work of your son, Jesus. Everything he accomplished in his life, in his death, his burial and resurrection, we stand on that solid rock and we approach your throne boldly today to touch your heart and say we love you, and to say you're worthy, to say you deserve all of this and more. You deserve our affection. You deserve our attention. You deserve time set aside. God, we want to bring great delight to your heart today. We want to bring great joy to your heart today. Thank you, God, that you make it simple and easy for us because we're only human to just set some time aside to give our thoughts and our attention to you and say you're worth it. We love you, God. God, I'm asking for this body of believers here, this church family here, these ears and hearts hearing the sound of my voice right now, Jesus, I'm lifting them up to you and I'm saying you've already given your life. How much more would you give us the ability to see past what's been holding us back so we can see how our life of devotion touches your heart. Would you give us that ability today? Would you help us, God, to shift in our hearts from a place of frustration to a place of confidence in you? Would you help us shift in our hearts from a place of obligation, of regret, of guilt, of always feeling like I'm just not doing enough, am I? I just, I, it's never enough but to a place of seeing that whatever time I spend is precious. It's, it's something God takes delight in. God, would you come shift our hearts to see that we can live all of life from a place of connection to your smile over us. Would you draw us, Lord, No sermon can do this. No prepared speech could ever shift our hearts to a place of longing for you or longing to live a life of prayer. Holy Spirit, you can do that, though. You can do that. Holy Spirit, come draw us to the heart of our Father this morning. Holy Spirit, come draw us into deeper into the love of the Son for us this morning. Holy Spirit, come lead us to truth. God, where we've been living in lies about how you think about us and how you look at us, God, would you bring us into the truth and the reality of just how treasured, precious, and dearly loved we are before you today. Thank you, God, for the reality of this truth. 